Hello, everyone. Let's begin with silent prayer. Okay. I need to Okay, today I would like to share a little bit about the Electoral College in the United States. Yeah. It is a body of officials who directly vote for the president. The Constitution describes this in Article 2, Section 1. So basically, when Americans cast their vote, they are actually directing other people the electors to vote for the candidate who receives the most votes in their state. The political party winning candidate und der Kandidat von so, the Democrats win. Então, se os Democratas ganharem, they would send their pre-selected electors to cast the vote for president. Unlike any other country, the popular vote is not a guarantee that you win the election. So how did the United States get such a voting system? So we're going to do a brief history of the United States. Vamos fazer um, uma história dos Estados Unidos. Vamos anschauen. United, United States of America, nunca iu. Uh, United States. Se calhe que pambili nunca bem. So we start with the Articles of Confederation. They were ratified in 1781. And for six years, it governed the Confederation of States. The, the, the structure combined a weak national government with strong state governments.
the 13 states were very independent. And the Confederation Congress was very limited on how they can govern the states. E esse Congresso, Confederação, um, se fundo se... Titanda, se eu te vai te ungava, vai ungava, Sandra, nige, e states, eu ganhei, e indaule. So, there's a lot of history that we're bypassing. that leads to the Constitutional Convention of 1787. 1787. So we have a group of founders who are working to figure out how to create a new country. They have a deep distrust of executive power. And they had just fought their way out from being under a tyrannical king. The last thing they wanted was a despot on their hands. So on May 25th of 1787, the Constitutional Convention began. The Constitution has been referred to by some historians as a bundle of compromises. Because all the delegates had to give up some of their favorite ideas. There was give and take between the 13 states. They had to do it or no one would ratify the Constitution. So under the Articles of Confederation, uh, each state had one vote. So when they entered the convention, they had to decide how the state, sorry. they had to decide how the states would be represented. So during the Confederation, it was very simple. One state, one vote. Now they're looking at 
two options. To represent the states by population, or by equal representation. So the great compromise was to combine the two. So the House of Representatives is determined, uh, the representatives are determined by the population of the states. And the Senate has equal representatives for each state. So in the United States, there are two senators per state. And then the representatives vary per state per population. So this one is called the Great Compromise. The next one is the Three-Fifths Compromise. So once it was decided that representation was in the House, was based on population. The delegates from the North and the South saw a problem. How should the enslaved people be counted? Interestingly, in 1783, there was a three-fifths compromise introduced. And it had to do with taxation. The Continental Congress could not tax the people directly. So this is in 1783. The argument was, are the enslaved people or property? So the Congress could only tax on the wealth of the state, not the people. So this three-fifths compromise resolution failed. The southern states saw no benefit. And the convention needed a unanimous vote for the resolution to pass. Um, 
um, everybody had to vote on the agree. They all had to agree. agree. Okay, back to 1787 and the Constitutional Convention. The same issue of representation. The northern states didn't believe they should be represented. They didn't want the enslaved people to provide the South with a greater number of representatives. So of course the Southern states wanted the enslaved individuals to be counted for representation. So basically, out of every five enslaved people, only three counted. This compromise passed. The South saw the benefit. They received one third more representatives and electors. They knew it gave them more power. The next issue that had a lot of debate and arguing in the Constitutional Convention was how do you elect a president, the executive power? A delegate from Pennsylvania said, The president should be chosen by a direct national vote of the people. A delegate from Connecticut said, the president ought to be elected by Congress. Keep in mind at this time that the voters were white males over age 21. And who owned land. And the indirect vote by Congress was white, was done by white males. So at that time, that was the people who could vote. So this issue created heated debate among the delegates.
And towards the end of the convention, James Madison quickly wrote out a mode of electing the president. by a college of electors. This section in the Constitution is longer and goes into more detail than any other single issue addressed in the Constitution. So they agreed to have the Electoral College. This Wahlkollegium geben würde. With no distinction. No difference. They were voting for president and vice president. But in those days, everybody was running for president. Because the one who gets the majority vote of electors He becomes the president. The other presidential candidate who has the second most votes is elected the vice president. So to be elected president, you need the majority of electoral votes. The vice president does not. So the first two presidential elections were George Washington. And he won the majority of the electoral votes. In both elections. So they didn't see any problems with the Electoral College.
So I've added just a little footnote. That in the year 1792, was the first time the post office was used to inform the electorate. They were able to mail information to help people understand the issues and the candidates. And of course, the voters are still only white males over 21. The next election was 1796. And at the time, the French Revolution was going on. So John Adams, who's a Federalist, he received the majority of electoral votes. But because the Federalists scattered their second votes for vice president, Thomas Jefferson received the second highest votes from the Electoral College. Okay, so now they see a problem. They have John Adams, he's a Federalist, he's pro-British, he's pro-British, he becomes president. Thomas Jefferson is a Democratic Republican. He's also pro-French. And he's the vice president. So it became apparent, it became clear that having a vice president, having a vice president and president unwilling, unwilling to work together was going to be a significant problem. This is when major parties
attempted to fix the situation by having the president and vice president elected on a party ticket. This increased the possibility of having political allies serve as president and vice president. So in January of 1797, a delegate from South Carolina presented a resolution on the floor of the House of Representatives. For he wanted to present, he wanted an amendment to the Constitution requiring each elector to cast one vote for president and another for vice president. However, no action was taken on his proposal. And it set the stage for the election of 1800. The election of 1800 exposed a defect in the Electoral College. That there could be a tie between two candidates of the most popular ticket. To prevent this, they had one of the electors abstain from voting for vice president. As it turned out, no one abstained. And the election ended in a tie between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. So now a contingent presidential election
I don't hear her. Okay, yes, okay. I'll say it again. Okay. So the the election had to be determined by the House of Representatives. Así que como había un empate, no tenía que ser determinada por la Casa. Die, die Wahl musste also vom Repräsentantenhaus entschieden werden, und zwar ähm, mit einer Nachwahl. The House was gridlocked and voted 36 times. Before the tie was finally broken. <lacht> And Jefferson was officially elected president in February of 1801. It was this election that persuaded the delegates they needed to make a change. to make a change in the electoral college. So in 1804, we got the 12th amendment to the constitution. Every presidential election since 1804 has been conducted under the terms of the 12th Amendment. Hey, your 12th Amendment. And it stipulates the electors must vote for the president and the vice president separately. Okay. I'm going to take a photograph of the board because I need the board to put other things up on the second part of this. Um, so I'm going to erase, I mean, photograph first, then erase, and then um, we'll, we'll continue.
So how exactly are the electors chosen? So presidential electors meet every four years. And they cast a vote for the president and the vice president. And there are a various ways of choosing the electorate. Thirty three states. Vote by party convention. They choose by party convention. Seven choose by state party committees. And then 10 states use appointments through the governor, the political party, or a combination of or a combination of So in America there are 538 electors. Así que en América tenemos 538 electores. 538 dieser Mukatme America no no to tumune from the equal the Senate. Ba 100 sige ila ba ba mele Senate. Four hundred and thirty-five of the House. And three from Washington, D.C. So when Americans go to vote in November, They go to the polling place and cast their vote for their candidate. They think they're voting directly for the president. So 
So you have candidate A and candidate B that are running for president. But what they don't realize, not everyone does, is that there are these, this group of electors. And their vote goes to the elector first. Once then they begin, they count all the votes. To make it simple, I'm going to keep the number small. And we'll say the total votes was 20,000. So candidate A got 10,010 votes. Candidate B got 9,990 votes. For that state, let's just say it's Idaho, and let's say they have five electoral votes. It's, most people think that the popular vote is what elects the president subconsciously. Because they believe in one person, one vote. The majority vote is what wins in the state elections. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, the 10,010 votes are the winners. So those votes went to the elector and and he will vote for that candidate. And that candidate picks up five electoral votes. What happens? to the 9,990 votes
have no value in the state of Idaho. And they have no value for candidate B that they voted for. The 9,900 vote, 90 votes will be added to the national popular vote. But it's not the popular vote that secures the presidency. It's only the electoral votes. So in our election history in America, we have had 58 presidential elections. Fifty-three presidents won the popular vote and the electoral vote. But there have been five elections where the popular, win the popular vote, lose the election. Oh, I'm sure. There were five elections where the president won the popular vote but lost the election. And that's because the president is not elected by the popular vote. To win the election, You need to win 270 of the electoral votes. Forty-eight states have forty-eight states award all of their electoral votes if you have a 51 percent majority in the vote you win all the electoral votes.
two states. divide their electoral votes according to percentage. So if this election had been the state of Maine, Instead of all of the electoral votes going to candidate A, they would divide it, let's say three votes for one candidate and two votes for the other candidate. So when candidates win the most popular, most populated states, they will probably win the popular vote. But the opponent who wins the smaller states could end up winning the electoral college. And that's basically what happened in 2016. In 1824, there was an election of John Quincy Adams Andrew Jackson William Crawford and Henry Clay They were all of the same political party. When the votes were counted, Andrew Jackson won most of the popular vote and the electoral college. But to win the presidency, Jackson had to have a majority of the electoral votes. So when there's no majority of electoral votes in, a, in an election, The vote goes to the House of Representatives. So in 
So the House of Representatives can only vote for the top three contenders. The House voted to make Adams president. Even though Andrew Jackson had 99 electoral votes and Adams had 84. Henry Clay wasn't a part of the election process in the House of, oh my God. let me rephrase that. Henry Clay was eliminated because he didn't make it in the top three. But he was the Speaker of the House. So Andrew Jackson accused them of corruption. Because John Adams appointed Henry Clay as his Secretary of State. The next election is 1876. Rutherford Hayes. And he's a Republican. This was the first time that there was an electoral crisis where neither candidate again had, um, wait a minute, let me rephrase that. Congress decided this election also. The opponent had 184 electoral votes. He was one vote short of having the majority. So the Congress didn't know how to handle this. So they created the Federal Electoral Commission. There were 20 disputed electoral votes. And they were given to Rutherford Hayes. He won 185 to 184 in the electoral votes. The commission gave those 20 electoral votes to Hayes. Because a deal had been made. Historians think that the Democrats, who had a stronghold in the South, agreed to let Hayes be president
in return for the Republicans to pull federal troops from the former Confederate states. And this affected the reconstruction. And it was abandoned in 1877. The next election was 1888. Benjamin Harrison. And he's a Republican. So there was a lot of corruption during this campaign. Voters were being bribed to vote for particular people. And it ended up that Harrison won the electoral, but he lost the popular. He, um, Harrison lost the popular vote by 90,000. But he won, and he but he won the electoral vote. Two thousand is the next vote of election. It was between George Bush and Al Gore. It was a very close race. And it ended up going to the Supreme Court. Gore won the popular vote by 500,000 votes. And George Bush had 271 electoral votes. And the minimum is 270. That's how close he won. And then it went to the Supreme Court and they voted in favor of George Bush. which helped him get to 271 electoral votes. And the last one is Donald Trump. A Republican. He lost the popular vote by 2.8 million votes. But he had 304 electoral votes.
So this presentation was just to build a foundation for tomorrow. This, sh this showed the progress of the electoral college and presidential elections. And tomorrow we'll go deeper and to show how um, corruption and various things are used to manipulate the voters and the vote. Okay, we'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for this opportunity to gather around the world. to study history that we may learn the present. We thank you for your leading and guiding through all these um, camp meetings. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.